Hey, I'm Michael Hoff with Digital Theologian, and today you are in for a treat in this bonus video. I sat down the other day on a Zoom call with Daniel Bunn Jr., Assistant Professor of Old Testament at Oral Roberts University. Now, Daniel and I go way back. We met when Daniel was the chaplain on the floor that I lived on, sophomore and junior years of college. We roomed together part of the year, senior year, before he got married. And so we were in each other's weddings. We've known each other for years. Uh, as I think Daniel points out in the video, you'll see uh, our friend would be 18 right now. So our, our friendship could vote uh, in this upcoming election. And so uh, we've known each other for a long time. We were close friends. We were in an accountability group together. Like we have called each other periodically over the years. It's been, uh, we have remained close. And so it's a joy for me to be able to share with you this conversation that he and I had, where we unpack some of the connections between Genesis, one of Daniel's areas of interest and study, and the Gospel of John, which by this point might be one of your areas of interest and study. I hope you enjoy it. I know I enjoyed having this conversation with Daniel, and if you enjoy it half as much as we enjoyed having the conversation, then I think it's going to be worth the time to watch it. You have a great day, and I'll see you on the other side. So Daniel, for anybody that like wants to to find more from you, they've appreciated what you've added to this this conversation today. And uh, you know, where can they find you? Where where are you posting? What are you doing? What's going on? Just unpack yeah. that a little. Bit. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I uh, I'm on again, off again. I guess as most people are with a blog. Uh, <laughs> my name it's Daniel Bun Junior dot com. So that's Daniel and Bun B U N N J R dot com. Uh, where I, you know, just more for my own well-being. I just, it's, I found that's a useful space to reflect on different, different issues and topics, whatever. I found your reflections to be useful too. I've, ah. I, you know, read, you know, I, you're my friend. So I see these <laughs> things and I like, and I'm like, oh, hey, Daniel posted another blog. So I've really ah. enjoyed, you know, I've, I've been enriched as a result of reading those. So awesome. I, well, thanks. that's good, man. Any any other yeah. place where the you're, uh... the main way I'm 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 real great about trying to stay in touch through email and I love to get questions even people I don't know I get questions from you know, people all the time and I like to engage in conversation and if I can help point people in the right direction on any particular topic or conversation I'm glad to do that and then my email I'll just give my ORU email even it's uh, just dbun uh, at oru dot edu so all people right. can reach me there and again I don't by any means pretend to be the expert on <laughs> all things. Uh, but I, uh, I, I love to walk with you. If I can contribute to people's journey in any way, I like to, like to be able to do that. So. Man, Daniel, it's, it's great talking with you. I mean, I, I love, you know, I mean, I, from the time we were roommates all the way through, man, it's mm -hmm. been, uh, <laughs> you're one of my favorite people. Uh, we were in, in each other's weddings. We've, we've been around each other for a long time and apart for a long time. But uh, yeah, when you and I started talking kind of about uh, the connections between Genesis and the gospel of John, and you, you started kind of unpacking some, some big picture stuff, I really wanted to hear what you had to say. So um, welcome to Digital Theologian, and I am very glad to be able to talk with you today. Yeah, I'm, gra I'm glad to see you. And as, as you may or may not remember, I like to I like dealing with numbers. I always like remember birthdays and that sort of stuff. But I was just thinking oh, about dear. the fact that uh, you still know my social, don't you? Well, I do absolutely do. It's easy though. I'll I'll make sure I print that on. <laughs> no, I post it on my website usually. But, uh, it's been it's crazy. It's been almost as long since we met as it was from the time we were born until we met. <laughs> yeah. Kids were, are eight, who were born when we met are now 18 years old. Yeah, it's just yeah, crazy. So, you know, so it's, we've, we've known each other for a long time. You know, it's, it's just hard to believe. Hard to believe how long it's been. <laughs> uh, and it, it's, we're getting old, Daniel. That's what it means. Getting old. I know, right? Yeah, so uh, I've spent the last 30-some uh, day. Actually, we're over 40 days. I, mm -hmm. I, you know, I should have probably done a little more research into Lent before I started doing a 40 days with Jesus uh, during Lent. This is part of uh, coming from a non-liturgical uh, calendar uh, segment of the church. Uh, you did like, 40 Oh, yeah, days. Lent. You know, that's like 40 days. Like, that's, that's, and I'm not, you know me. I mean, you're all about numbers, and I'm numerically dyslexic. So, like, oh, yeah, 40 days. That's, right, that's got to be 40 days. So, 40 days with Jesus. We'll go through John. It'll be awesome. What do you mean Lent's longer than 40 days? <laughs> in, in, in the church, when we say something's 40 days, we mean it might be 40 days, it might be 46 days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, so and it's like, does Lent officially end on Good Friday 
or Easter Sunday. Even though I've been a pastor for 13 years, there are still things that I learn uh, all the time. <laughs> yeah, I really wanted to hear some, you know, hear you talk some about uh, the connections between Genesis and the Gospel of John. And I mean, I have such a deep appreciation for John as a writer. Mm -hmm. I know his Greek's not great. I know he uses simplistic language. But uh, I think that there's like a next level to the way that he frames things that I really appreciate. And um, just going through, I mean, there's a ton of repetition, but it's purposeful. And mm -hmm. uh, in so many individual narratives, John is talking on two levels. And uh, so there's a deeper level of thinking that's going on a lot of times mm -hmm. in the Gospel of John. And, um, you know, that's been something that I've found really refreshing kind of going through this. But uh, you hit on some things from from an Old Testament perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, you as a, an Old Testament pro professor at Oral Roberts University uh, wanted to tap into some of that knowledge and just get some of your thoughts on this. It doesn't take uh, you know someone with a PhD to recognize John is different than the first three: Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, he's doing something different, you know, and uh, in ways that uh, are, are just just totally in a different direction. Um, and yeah, I, th I think John has become more appreciated. I'm not a John scholar. I'm not a New Testament guy. But from what I, what I know, John has become more appreciated. At, at, at all, the, all the biblical authors, they're, they're being appreciated as theologians uh, more so now um, than they had been in previous generations. And so people are looking at, yeah, yeah, maybe on the surface, some of what John's doing might seem simplistic, straightforward, or whatever. Uh, but there's clearly a depth there to what he's doing as he is doing theology, uh, which, which for me is really one of the bigger issues that, that grabs my attention. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. study the Old Testament, PhD in the Old Testament, but it was it's always, how do we read these books as Christians? How does that affect what, what we're doing? And one of the main implications, I think, is causes us to appreciate how all the authors in the Bible are doing theology. Uh, they're not just, you know, not, maybe not in the sense that we might think of when we use that language. They're not sitting down and saying, what are my thoughts on God and the Trinity? And so they're doing it in, the, in a pastoral context. They're asking, who is God and what is God up to? And uh, John is doing some profound things <clears throat> in general. But as an Old Testament guy, especially someone who uh, is very interested in Genesis, uh, for a long time have picked up even just with a cursory reading of John, not diving in too deeply at an academic level, picked up the ways in which John seems to be doing something with Genesis. And then to find out that many people have, been, have done work on that, um, that caught my attention. Yeah. And uh, so, so that's, yeah, I, I'm, I'm interested to look more into the way he's interacting with Genesis in the detail, but also just, what his interaction with Genesis shows us about how he understands the process of thinking theologically, thinking about yeah. who God is and what God's up to. That's good. And would you be able to speak a little bit more to, you know, that whole element of as Old Testament writers are, are really creating what we now call scripture, you know, that they're, they're thinking theologically and they're doing it in a specific context. Um, you know, just as maybe folks that are, have always looked at the Bible as just sacred text and sacred text only, and, and maybe have um, maybe been raised or trained with a view of uh, God shut off the mind of the author. Um, so what does it really mean for, you know, for, for the Bible to be scripture and, and this is a big question, but uh, to be scripture and uh, for, for these individual authors to be thinking about God and working out some of that within a specific context. This whole idea of, talking about the writers of scripture doing something and doing theology, it assumes what the, the church has more or less assumed throughout its history, that the Bible is both fully the product of God, but it fully utilizes humans. Um, there, there are no official statements that are held by the church or even by, by the Jewish faith communities before it, that say, for instance, Genesis was just divinely, uh, you know, just, just delivered, dropped down into the lap of some author, and they just merely passed it on. It, that's never been a part of what the church has affirmed when it talks about spirit-inspired scripture. Mm. The church has assumed uh, that the authors were led by the spirit, 
but they were a part, they were doing something. They were a part of the process. And so uh, most, most uh, in the scholar, in the, in the world of scholarship, but then in the church as well have, have recognized there, there is this dynamic then that we have to consider. And there are people all across the spectrum for how to, how to handle that. But this idea that it is God, but it's also human. Um, and, and so for someone like myself, who I consider myself charismatic, um, I'm also very influenced by the Wesleyan tradition. There's space for saying both the writing of scripture, the passing it on, and even the reading of scripture are spirit inspired. But all of those stages along, uh, along the path involve humans too. Uh, my, my growth it involves me doing something, but it's only in response to God's, God's grace by the spirit that I can do it. Yeah. So. That's, I mean, that's so important because, you know, just coming kind of to the end of the gospel of John, mm -hmm. you know, Jesus says, you know, blessed are you when you do, uh, he, yeah. he recognizes like, it's, it's great that, you know, mm -hmm. you know, there's that, that experiential knowledge component, mm -hmm. but you're blessed in the doing. And, yeah. um, like that has that, that kind of phrasing of things like mm -hmm. has, has really hit me. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, it just places so much emphasis on our response to what God has initiated. Yeah. Yeah. And then that's a dynamic, I think, within the gospel itself, the gospel message itself, this idea of God initiates and God empowers, but the, there's a response that's anticipated by God. And we see this with Jesus in his own life and throughout the Bible. There's this assumption. I've been going a lot lately through the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, those, those books. And there's built into those books, this assumption, God commands and God frees the people, but then God expects them to do something like it's, it's, it's so yeah, there's this role for humans in this process. And so in terms of writing scripture, uh, the, the, the church has more or less assumed uh, for, for much of its history that the humans were a part of this and they were writing a pastoral, a theological word to a certain audience in a certain time. And that word though, has been by the spirit used to speak to the whole, the whole of God's people. But there's this dynamic then that we have to appreciate that this word is a universal word, but it first came to a very concrete situation, a concrete audience. And uh, we, we have to appreciate that and navigate that that dynamic. Yeah. <clears throat> I think about um, grasping God's word, this um, oh, okay. which is mm -hmm. such a, a really helpful kind of hermeneutics textbook um, that, that really walks you through the, the whole process of understanding how to read, first of all, because mm -hmm. scripture is written uh, and maybe it's been delivered orally throughout much of history because, you know, such a small percentage of the population could read. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, as we interact with God's word, uh, the written word so frequently that is it's a text in front of us. Mm -hmm. And so we need to understand language, but they use uh, the model of the interpretive journey and, and they talk about going from uh, the village, you know, the, uh, the tent, you know, this old mm -hmm. Testament context, right. Uh, Abraham living in tents, uh, you know, out in the wilderness. That's uh, an intense of, life to live. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh, there it is. There it is. Uh, should know more than once. Uh, that will happen again, I am sure. But right, so going from that, like that mm -hmm. time frame and that uh, that world, you have to you have to travel. There's a journey to get to where mm -hmm. we are now, and that's an interpretive journey. You have to measure some some distances uh, of language and culture and gender and you know all of these things that have to be considered. Right, if uh, if you know for all of the the ladies that are reading it, recognizing that. The, the majority of scripture has been written by men and mm -hmm. possibly all of it was written by men. Um, Hebrews being the, the exception for anybody wondering, um, you know, and just uh, kind of wrestling through some of those differences and, and building a bridge to cross those differences mm -hmm. ultimately to arrive in our own context. And um, yeah, so, I mean, going on that interpretive journey is, is, mm -hmm. uh, it's a helpful metaphor and mm -hmm. uh, I've, it's one I've leaned on over the years. So, yeah. That's a helpful way to think about it. And it's, it, it calls attention to what in my, my own experience personally, um, yeah. you know, so I came from a certain context in which the immediacy of scripture, it's there, it's mine, it speaks to me. And that's important. Mm -hmm. It has obstacles that it puts out in front of you as a reader though. I went from that to the opposite extreme of, Oh, 
there is no, it's, it's so, you know, hidden in the, in the woods that I, I have to take this impossible journey to get to it. And I might not ever get there. It's totally not, it's other, you know, yeah. and finding that both are in play. Um, and even within that, there's this built in challenge. I, again, per, speaking personally, uh, there's a comfort to both of those the, the immediacy it, it, causes me to uh, see that some of that work is, I can say, is unnecessary. And so then it's a little easier in that regard. Uh, the ease that might come with making the text other is when I encounter something I just don't like, <laughs> I can say, oh, well, that's not what it really means if I get to, you know, <laughs> this is, I'm speaking real about what happens in actual. Yeah. This, that's that's <laughs> how we function. We would, uh, we would never say that uh, in a doctrinal statement, but yeah. in reality, yeah. uh, I think you're right. And I think that that's, yeah. you know, and, you know, kind of a, piggybacking on that same thought, uh -huh. you know, there are segments of the church that emphasize different portions of scripture. Yeah. And, you know, there are some that, that really latch on to the book of Romans and mm -hmm. they see everything throughout the rest of scripture mm -hmm. you know, through the, the lens of Romans and maybe even a few chapters within, you know, within the letter of Romans. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but, you know, I, I attended a, an Anabaptist seminary and it was really refreshing for me because they were just honest. They, they said, <laughs> you know, uh, we look at everything through through the lens of the Sermon on the Mount. And mm -hmm. for us, that is the highest, that is the pinnacle of the teaching of Scripture. We mm -hmm. find the fulfillment of theology in Jesus. This is Jesus's greatest hits from a sermon standpoint. Mm -hmm. And so we look there first mm -hmm. and every, everywhere else second. So, they, they, you know, there's an intellectual honesty yeah. um, in the midst of that. You know, because <laughs> we really, on some level, we all, we all do that. And, we all um, kind of do that, yeah. At least you know, as have, a starting point, right? And, and, yeah. And that sort of intellectual awareness and honesty is so important uh, to anything, but especially reading the Bible, right? Because, uh, you know, it's for several hundred years, what's been in, in an academic context, uh, but as an example, what's been talked about as the way to do scholarship turns out to be a very white European <laughs> Western way of doing things. Male. <laughs> um, male. And so, we, so say, we say as two white guys sitting here uh, exactly. having this conversation exactly. in the West. But. Exactly. But it's been humbling to recognize that you know, I, I bring with me certain stuff. It can be helpful. It can be illuminating, but it can also become an obstacle. And, yeah. Um, so that, Especially that, when that's the only voice that has a seat at the table. Uh, yeah. I think that yeah. when, when other voices aren't being heard yeah. or are being excluded or pushed to the margin for, yeah. to prioritize that voice, I think then, I mean, we lose – we lose so much as the body of Christ. And I think, you know, especially in light of, uh, you know, the difference that, you know, certain segments of the church are making in the world right now, mm -hmm. uh, thinking about the last two Nobel Peace Prize winners being African Pentecostals. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, uh, you know, so if you're coming from a, a white Western viewpoint and you have a, such a low view of, you know, African spirituality or the African mm -hmm. church, well, you know, you're missing out on, on a, a major renaissance that's going yeah. on right now yeah. as that segment of the church is impacting the entirety of the world. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, as Christians especially, uh, serves us well to recognize. And that's, you know, in terms of this, seeing the text as other, uh, it, 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 there, there's a safeguard within a communal context, when we are surrounded by voices, other voices, especially those not like us, it, it, there's a safeguard built into that so that when we see something we don't like because it doesn't fit with our worldview, we can have others there to say, oh, that might be more about you than it is about the text. And, you know, bringing John kind of back mm -hmm. into focus. Yeah. Um, you know, how does this apply? How does this connect with the gospel of John? Yeah, so... so <clears throat> Appreciating that John is doing theology. Uh, the Gospel of John is doing theology. It's inviting its audience members to reflect on who God is and what God's up to in the world and in, in their lives. Um, it, one of the things that sticks out to me, again, as I sort of referred to earlier, is the way he's clearly uh, interacting with Genesis at some level. And, and what I mean by that, just a couple of examples um, Scholars have long recognized the potential connection between John 1, which in the beginning was the Word, right? And uh, you know, 
I know you've already made it through John. So you've talked about most of, you know, most of these episodes I'll call attention to, but there's an obvious echo there. Uh, Now, one of the, one of the fields within scholarship that's really intriguing to me because of the payoff I think it has for us normal people as we reflect on the Bible is the field of intertextuality. And what I mean by that, just the simple version, it's a big academic field is it's, it's recognizing how one text depends on uh, other texts. It, it's a part of a, a, a world of texts. So um, an example, this is a silly example, but I've, I've thought of it often. One of, the, one of the more common things, at least that I do now, when I'm interacting through text message, Twitter, whatever, is the use of, and this is the correct pronunciation, GIFs. Um, <laughs> are you a GIF guy? It's, it's GIFs. Okay, so so I I uh, yeah we can have that conversation later, but <laughs> we, can, we can let the nerds debate that a little bit more later. In detail. But what what you know when I'm even just earlier today I'm text messaging with my brothers, and we often respond by using these gifs. Now what a gif yeah. is you know it's just a couple it's just a small segment usually from a movie or a show, and what we're doing is we're taking this older text, and we're bringing it into the newer conversation. Yeah. Now we're not saying. For instance, if I use something from, say, a movie like Dumb and Dumber, uh, you know, you're telling me there's a chance. But if I use that gif <laughs> in my conversation, I was way off. If I use that gif in the conversations with my brothers, what I'm not doing is I'm not saying Jim Carrey, when he was, do- was saying that line, knew that one day you and I were going to be talking, and he, you know, this is what he was looking forward to. No, what we're doing is we're, we have a shared connection with that movie and i'm using it to inform our current conversation knowing that i'm using it in new creative and even imaginative ways i'm not using it in a, I, i'm taking it out of context so to yeah. speak because it's informing my current conversation silly example but i think it's an enlightening way to look at how the new testament authors such as john are navigating the world they're in in particular, they have come to believe that Jesus, his life, death, and resurrection are starting points for reflecting on who God is. Mm-hmm. But they also have been enriched by what God has already been up to in Israel. So it's not the case that they see Jesus as the obvious and only sort of end point. He's point B of the Israel's point A. But I would suggest one way of considering what they're doing is Jesus is actually another point A, and it goes mm-hmm. both ways. They, they do have this old story of what God has been up to, and it has led to Jesus, but they're also aware that not everyone would agree with them that Jesus is the end point of that story. Yeah. But even still, they also see then now in, uh, they can move in the opposite direction. What has happened with Jesus has completely transformed their reality. Yeah. And they can now look backward to make sense of the old story. Well, that's, uh, and that's good because you see John doing that numerous times throughout the gospel, right? We're, uh-huh. we're told that, um, you know, they didn't recognize in various moments the significance of something that Jesus had said. Uh-huh. But then John said, after the resurrection. Yeah, yeah. They realize. So he's, he's yeah. pointing his, his folks back. He's pointing his readers back uh-huh. into that moment saying, look, I didn't understand this at the time. <laughs> But because of what happened later, now because of the resurrection, I now have a new viewpoint of yeah. that moment. And um, so there's some insertion of, well, I, just the, the passage that I covered yesterday, you know, thinking of the inclusion of Psalm 22, mm-hmm. right? Breathing fresh life into Psalm 22 um, with Jesus on the cross. It seems mm-hmm. like, you know, multiple, go- you know, multiple gospel authors are drawing on Psalm 22 while yeah. Jesus is on the cross. Yeah. And uh, then... You know, going um, back to some quotes from Isaiah, you know, that, mm-hmm. that Jesus is referencing, um, you know, so there, I mean, that's, he's pulling on that. So John yeah. is recognizing that, seeing maybe that Jesus is even recognizing that. And because uh, sometimes it's on, it's, it's out of the mouth of Jesus. And sometimes it's, it's from the pen of John. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's important to make that distinction. Um, even if ultimately John is the one that's relaying the words of Jesus, you know, uh-huh. I think that, you know, but seeing how that plays out. Um, like, yeah, I, it's great to, to really keep in mind that now mm-hmm. Jesus is a new point a through yeah. which to interpret 
previous previous material. Yeah, yeah it's a great example of sort of a, at a micro <clears throat> level what I think is even happening at a macro level in terms of the whole of what God's been up to yeah, and the lives of the disciples. We read, and, and it's easy to be led in this direction, we're, we're reading as if we're sort of walking alongside with the disciples in their process of discovery, their life with Jesus, and then who, but they were, those books were written after the fact, right? And we, yeah. as you said, even in these books, we see it wasn't until the resurrection and they had new lenses by which to see what had happened that they understood it, right? Yeah. And so similar thing in terms of big picture, it's not saying that any person can obviously see that the story of Israel leads to Jesus. Now, in fact, they're saying, no, it's, it requires, it's a spirit empowered lens through which yeah. we see this story. Well, that makes certainly sense? There, are, there are so many, you know, <laughs> there's so many Jewish leaders that don't see that right. same story. Right. I mean, that's at the heart of the gospel is the constant misunderstanding of the message mm-hmm. of Jesus. Yeah. So it's not just, so, so what that opens up then is it, it, in terms of this connection between John and Genesis at a, at that level, we see even from the opening words that calling to mind the phrase in the beginning, apart from trying to ask, did John intentionally do anything? The effect of someone who's been enriched by Genesis and is now reading John and has come to believe the sorts of things that uh, we believe about Jesus as Christians it opens up new and imaginative ways to read Genesis, right? So what, what he's doing, he's not saying the only and obvious way to understand Genesis 1 is in light of Jesus. But he is saying because of Jesus, I can go back to Genesis 1 and see fresh things. Mm. And so he's saying in the beginning, he, catches, he hooks people, the, the echo right. of Genesis 1, instead of God said which is what, you know, in Genesis, in the, I mean, God created. In the beginning, God created. It's was the word. So he, he's, he's doing some creative and imaginative work there, yeah. the theological work. He, he's, he's saying some important things about who Jesus is by tying him into that story of Genesis 1. And you know, various points along the way in John that are also interesting, uh, again, his use of days, now, on the first day, on the second day, on the third day, he moves through the sequence of days in Jesus' mm. life. Uh, then, interesting. Yeah, I hadn't noticed that. So that's uh, that's great. I'll have to yeah. look now. Now I've got you know I've got a go, I've got a I've got a new lens that I need to go back and look <laughs> yeah. through the gospel. Of John. Uh, so. uh, inception. <laughs> uh, it's yeah. So so it's it, it, in those first several chapters, everything is set up in terms of days so and, and it echoes again genesis 1 that on the first day god did this on the second day god so again i think john's echoing so again he's not it's not a so one, one of the issues i've run into is as christians again I'm, I'm, i might just be speaking from my own personal experience i was inclined to read the old testament as if it obviously and only in in all the detail pointed sort of mechanically to jesus mm. But what I'm coming to see is the New Testament authors didn't have such a mechanical understanding of the relationship. So they could go back and say, yeah, Genesis means a whole bunch of things. But now in light of Jesus, we can see both Genesis differently and we see Jesus differently by putting those two alongside each other. That's, that's a great point, Daniel, because, you know, I think that as, you know, as somebody like yourself, who's a Hebrew scholar, you know, uh, you know, the, the way Hebrew works, Mm-hmm. is through speaking on multiple levels, the mm-hmm. relatively small vocabulary. I mean, compared to Greek, certainly, you know, much, you know, far fewer words uh, uh-huh. in the language. And, yeah. and so they use those words more playfully, uh-huh. more um, may, rather than just making a new word, they invest new <laughs> meaning into an old word yeah. and then expect you to hold some of those intention. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I, I think that, I mean, we see we see John doing things like that, and mm-hmm. um, so that's that's really helpful because it's not unique to John, um, and right. it fits the Hebraic understanding. Um, yeah. It fits, you know, the, kind of the model that any any Jew would have kind of inherited uh-huh. during this time frame. So it's not yeah. like a foreign theological concept. Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It, it's certainly at home. Uh, with, with with the way you know it, it, with the way they were people were reflecting on these matters, uh, 
other other interesting just a couple of other really interesting details yeah. in John before sort of just talking more synthetically about all this um I actually had a student write a paper at ORU last semester his senior paper on some intertextuality of look, looking at John and Genesis together so it's a mm. fitting topic uh and he called attention to a lot of this detail in, in a lot more detail but just um one interesting uh, detail that emerges in looking at it in this light is uh, jumping to John 20 at the end of the gospel. You know, it yeah. begins verse one That's, early yeah, in the morning. That, recording that tonight. So this is all helpful. Perfect. Well, not without giving too much away then. <laughs> I don't want to. No, nope, uh, give it all away. Go for no, it. Just it's all free, man. But the very first verse, John 20, verse one, early in the morning of the first day of the week. Yeah. Uh, again, this language. So, so you know, on the, on the one level, Knowing that we're reading a, a narrative in literature, on the one level, that's just giving information. Yeah. But literature often functions in so much more nuanced ways than that. And again, especially if we've been reading John from yeah. chapter one, and especially if we've read Genesis, we have him call attention now to the first day of the week. And I'm not the, the first one to make these connections, but in a sense, just that simple use of language has a suggestion that this is the first day of the new creation, mm. um, which all that, that scene in John chapter 20 is taking place mm. in the garden. Um, so, so there's yeah. this intentional echo of Genesis 1. And, and so, again, what John's doing, I think, at a theological level is he's inviting readers to see that in Jesus, there's new creation, right? Mm. This is day one of the new creation. We're back in the garden. This is, this is the new creation. Wow. Uh, it's, it's really interesting then the, the role that Mary plays in yep. this, in this narrative, because if you're flipping things from Genesis, uh-huh. right, it's, it's Eve that uh, kind of bears the burden of the uh, fall. Yeah. Uh, but here, Mary is the faithful disciple. Yeah. You know, uh, certainly the, the disciple that Jesus loves, you know, beats Peter to the tomb. Mm. Um, but Mary stays yeah. and Mary weeps and she was mm-hmm. the first one there and she's the first one to encounter Jesus. Yeah. That, that's why I like having these conversations. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right. It's, 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 there's good stuff there. Yeah. And, and she, you know, N.T. Wright long ago, one of his, I forget, one of his 12 million books. Um, uh, he, he mentioned, he's, he's probably mentioned it in multiple books, but he, he makes this connection too. He, he, he says a lot of what I'm saying here, uh, but he calls attention to how one little subtle detail on the part of John. And again, it's moving beyond, did John intentionally do the, this? What was he, just, what, it's more moving to what That's happens. Present. What's the effect? Yeah. Uh, calls attention to the fact John mentions in narrating this event that she initially mistook Jesus for the gardener. Uh, and it calls yeah. attention to you. one of the first, the one way you could phrase what mm-hmm. Adam and Eve were tasked with doing was to be gardeners. Yeah. Um, and so, so again, this is tapping into the idea of Jesus as new Adam. I mean, it's, it's just a, yeah. it's, it's yeah. Well, and even going back to John 15, uh, mm-hmm. right. Yeah. That, that the father is the gardener. So now yeah, yeah. she sees Jesus post-resurrection and her ah, first connection good point. is to, to Jesus as gardener. Interesting. Um, and John's, yeah, that, that would be interesting, especially yeah. John where he's, if you've seen me, you've seen the father, this whole, you know, this, yeah. interesting. I hadn't thought about that he's before. Con- first time Jesus shows up after the resurrection, yeah. he's confused for the gardener. That's, for the gardener. That's interesting. That's interesting yeah. to look into that. Um, yeah. And, and, and yeah, Mary he, sees him. He speaks to her back ec- again, echoing back to, if you have Genesis in mind now, those cre- the creation, those first yeah. three chapters, God speaks to the people and they disobey. Here he speaks to Mary and she obeys. She goes, right? Um, yeah. And, and she, she shares this message and this is the beginning of the new creation. Um, so, so, so again, holding these two alongside each other, John gives us clues, I think, to hold them together. But even if he didn't, as those who are, who are nourished in the Old Testament, and in, to, the, to the greater extent that we, we do grow in that over time, and as we grow in our encounter with the Old Testament and the rest of the New Testament, these sorts of connections uh, can emerge. You know, we start to use certain things, you know, even just you mentioned John 15, it comes to mind because you've had that in mind. You know, you see those you connections. Yeah. Yeah. You hear the echoes, yeah. Yeah. And so I, I think what he's doing theologically then, apart from, again, like this mechanical 
Genesis said this, and it was obviously a prophecy leading to the fulfillment. And it, it's more creative and robust. It's Jesus is the beginning of the new creation. So I'm going to go back to creation and reflect on what that means. And there's an interplay then between the two as we hold them together. Um, and obviously, theologically, it's, it's inviting this, this notion that what, what's happening in Jesus is foundational, right? It's the new creation. He is the new creation. Um, so so that, that's what, you know, so, some of what emerges by just holding those two alongside each other. So. Uh, that's good, Daniel. I mean, that, I, th- I find that to be so helpful. And mm-hmm. rather than getting locked into a rigid kind of this must have meant that mm-hmm. to hold some of these things in tension and, and really have some humility and say, mm-hmm. this might have meant that. That's a helpful and way to phrase this, it, yeah. <laughs> this may mean that. Mm-hmm. And um, allowing then the resonance of the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart, right? If, if the Holy Spirit is mm-hmm. our teacher, for us to allow those things to resonate. Um, but at the same time, uh, to leave the ultimate conclusion of what is truth mm-hmm. up to the Spirit, the mm-hmm. Spirit of truth. And not yeah. to have to be the arbiter of truth ourselves, uh, and say, you know what, I, I think it's this, I believe it's that, I'm going to live my life as though it is this. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, at the whisper of the Spirit, I am open to having my opinion, my, the, how I hold this doctrine, or how mm-hmm. I hold this passage, how I interpret this. Uh, I'm willing to have that overturned and in, mm-hmm. to embrace a new understanding uh, because I am not the final definition. I'm not the final uh, arbiter. I'm not the final judge. Uh, that that I do, I've in, inherited a text that has been interpreted for thousands of years, and uh, I can have I can have communion, I can have interaction with the author, uh, the mm-hmm. divine author. Mm-hmm. While I may not be able to to touch base with John, mm-hmm. uh, I can still listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit as I'm reading and and engage in some of this, you know, this uh, I mean, theological imagination through mm-hmm. the process. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's, that's a, really helpful. Daniel. I think you've, you've, uh, you know, I mean, you're hitting on some things that I think are foundational and uh, are hugely helpful. If we start to, to just allow our worldview and our view of, of scriptural interpretation um, to be subtly massaged by it. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so, so thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And thanks for the way you put that right. That was really helpful. You know, say somebody who has, um, they're sitting down and they're starting to kind of go through the Bible uh, more consistently, or they're mm-hmm. wanting to get more as they're reading along. You know, mm-hmm. what, what do you say to them in light of some of these resonances that we, they might hear? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, I think two uh, dimensions of reading the Bible as scripture, uh, reading it as spirit inspired text uh, meant to, you know, shape us in our views of who God is and, means of encountering God, all that that might come with that. Uh, two dimensions that I, I, I sense in my, again, speaking personally and anecdotally, that I know I had, had not experienced initially in my own encounter with scripture. One is patience. <laughs> um, I, I'm learning that to read the Bible well, it just takes time. Mm-hmm. Um, as I go back through and and move through these stories, even things like Leviticus, as I move back through these texts over time, it, it, it's heard of it. Um, (laughs) It's, it's, you know, it just takes time to get familiar with and to have it seep into your bones so that you can see a broader perspective. Um, Yeah. So, so partly just patience. I mean, it's not a surprise that we struggle with that in our culture when we're, you know, everything's instant. So we want to read something once and get it and have all this, you know, it yeah. partly just takes time. Um, but then the second dimension, the communal nature of, of reading scripture, I, 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 the Bible to read the Bible as scripture is to do so as a part of a community and within yeah. communal context, what that means. I mean, that's, you know, that's, uh, I have to pin that down within our own local communities and situations. Uh-huh. Um, but it's, it's not something that was ever intended. I mean, if you re- read in Acts, you see the early Christians, they gathered as a community and they, yeah. they were led by the Spirit as a community. It wasn't always, I mean, the Spirit led individuals 
but in yeah. service of the community. It was never just like, you go do your thing, you go do your thing. We're all just individuals. It was, yeah. it was a communal process. And it, practically why that's helpful is as we find ourselves sitting alongside those who have been doing this for 30 years and those who have just now touched the Bible for the first time, there's built in this process of sharing wisdom and in, 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 in walking alongside one another on this, this journey, as you used the metaphor earlier, this interpretive journey that we have someone who's been there and they can, they can help us, they can guide us, you know, and, and as we grow and learn, learn to do this ourselves. Um, so, so those would be the two more immediate things. I mean, you know, that's, uh, there's a tendency in these sorts of conversations to move into technicalities and start, or tech, you know, the technical details and start talking about, go get this resource, do that. But I mean, a good portion of it, if you, if you just sit down with a Bible and are reading it more often, and are talking with someone else, maybe even actually reading with someone else in the context of the community, you'll get most of the way down that path, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. without having to have all this academic background and experience. It's, it's the spirit works through the text, you know. You know, it's, it's so funny because like on a practical level, I'm like, oh yeah, you know, I'll, I'll, I want to do a giveaway at the end of the 40 days and man, I'll pull together some resources and like that'll get people excited and we'll, you know, I'll hand out a few things that have been really helpful for me. And then as I've gone through the 40 days consistently, it just comes back to me for, for me, like uh -huh. sitting down and spending time with the text <laughs> is absolutely the best thing. Like, yeah, like, I mean, I remember how helpful, you know, the new Bible dictionary or the anchor uh -huh. Bible dictionary was for us in undergrad and, you know, uh, coming, you know, encountering the NIV application commentary for the gospel of John. I, I've still leaned heavily on Gary Burge and his work, mm -hmm. you know, as I've, I've unpacked these last 40 days or whether it's, mm -hmm. you know, Leon Morris or, uh, you know, J. Ramsey Michaels, some of these that have written commentaries on, on John and various series that have, you know, been helpful at, at individual points. Mm -hmm. The most beneficial thing has been close reading of the Bible mm -hmm. and pay attention to the details that are there, read it, read it again, and go over it again and again. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> I, I mean, before I, I can even talk about any passage, I, I, I have to read it you know, three, four times to mm -hmm. kind of get it familiar, you know, and, and this is, I mean, the gospel of John is, you know, my favorite book, you know, growing up, you know, mm -hmm. for the first 15 years of my Christian experience, it was one mm -hmm. that I would probably read more than any other. And, and if you ask me my favorite verse, it's John sixteen thirty three. And if you ask me my favorite chapter, it's John 16, you know, mm -hmm. the, my favorite section of scripture, it's probably John 14 through 16, right? It's mm -hmm. elements of Jesus with uh, maybe back to 13. So you get the first foot washing too, foot washing. But, <laughs> you know, like all of this, where you see a, 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 this humble portrait of Jesus and there's the promise of the spirit. Like those mm -hmm. are the, like that portrait of Jesus combined with the promise of the spirit and you will do greater works. Like mm -hmm. uh, that was really all I needed for a long time. But, mm -hmm. you know, looking at those individual details as you read along, is just, it's the most helpful thing that mm -hmm. you can do. And so, no, I, yeah. I appreciate you saying that Daniel and hearing, hearing you as an expert. Um, the other thing that I wanted to comment on as, uh, as a church history guy now, mm -hmm. I'm still learning to put that hat on now mm -hmm. after <laughs> You know, that's a, it's a growing, <laughs> growing strength of mine, but, uh -huh. uh, you know, it's uh, beginning to hear each passage in light of the conversation that's been going on for 2000 years. And yeah. one of the things I'm looking forward to most after kind of getting out of the sprint that is this 40 days with Jesus is being able to draw on, you know, Chrysostom. Uh, or mm -hmm. Augustine, uh, to look at Wesley and Calvin and Luther surrounding any passage that mm -hmm. we discuss and having, at least having the freedom to do that. And, yeah. um, you know, with the pace of things for the 40 days, just hasn't been possible. Mm -hmm. Haven't been able right, to bring right. in the dialogue partners. And, you know, honestly, for an eight minute video, you know, I mean, we're, we'd be here half an hour, you know, with yeah. those videos, yeah. be half an hour uh, for a daily video and, and you know, Ain't nobody got time for that. So, um, yeah, you know, I, I appreciate you bringing in the fact that uh, we are a part of a broader community. And I did just mm -hmm. want to add that, like, I think that that is a historical community as well exactly. as a as a physical local community. Yeah. I mean, I can't wait until we get back to being able to, you know, get together face to face. But, man, stuff like this on Zoom is so, mm -hmm. so refreshing. And, yeah. um, I mean, 
being able to look at each other and, and talk to each other and, mm-hmm. and wrestle through something. I mean, I've been, I've been greatly encouraged and mm-hmm. by just by our conversation today. So Same here. Um, Same here. thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks for those insights, man. It's been, uh, I really, really appreciate you taking the time to, to do this and to have some of these conversations. Oh man, I'm, I'm honored to do it. I'm excited for what you've been doing with the, the, the 40, six day journey and uh <laughs> and uh <Hashtag> not liturgical <laughs> and what is uh, liturgy i don't know <laughs> and as as always i you know your, your wisdom and the way you've put things together even expressing some of these thoughts today helpful helpful way to frame my own thoughts here <laughs> i kind of have some thoughts bouncing around in my head and hearing you put it so nicely i'm like ah that, that's what i meant <laughs> so, that's, the, thank you, so. <laughs> that's the benefit of community right you hear, exactly. hear somebody else process what you've been saying or thinking yeah. And oh yeah no that's that's how i want to say it yeah um yeah yep. you've, I mean, you've helped clarify my thought on a few things today as well so i mean i, I really appreciate it and i appreciate you yeah yeah uh, daniel and i were roommates um back before uh Either of us were married. So yeah, man, there's some, some fun, fun history uh, for the two of us, but uh, no, Daniel, I appreciate you taking the time today, man. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Glad to be here.